Thank you. Okay. So, um, hi everyone. On behalf of Elephant Artist Relief Society, also known as EAR and the EAR Leadership Team, I'd like to officially welcome you all to Grant Writing 101 Part 1. My name is Margo Armstrong, also known by some of, to, by some of you as Jill, and I'm a longtime EAR board member and also part of EAR's programming committee. And now I'd like to begin tonight's event in the spirit of respect, reciprocity, and truth by honoring and acknowledging Mokinstis and the traditional Treaty 7 territory and oral practices of the Blackfoot Confederacy, including the Siksika, Gainai, Pikani, as well as the Iyasi Nakoda and Sutuna nations. Ear acknowledges that this territory is also cherished by the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3, within the historical Northwest Métis homeland. We celebrate all nations, Indigenous and non, who honor this land. We're grateful to learn and engage in an honest process of reconciliation. We are all treaty people. We're grateful to each of you this evening for choosing to spend your evening with us. Thank you so much for being here. Our grant writing event this evening is a continuation of a tradition now, a resource that EAR has offered for over a decade. In the past couple of years, it has been modified, modified a little and is now integrated into our ongoing series of EAR events called Umbrella Talks. We now offer grant writing talks in February and August of each year. This is EAR's uh, first grant writing event for um, August 2023, and we will be featuring Chris Carson from Carpac, Alberta, Carrie McQueen from Alberta Foundation for the Arts, and Taylor Poitras from Calgary Arts Development. Now, just a little bit more about Elephant Artist Relief Society. Our primary purpose is to empower artists in Calgary and area to survive and thrive as artists. And these umbrella talks are one way we work towards achieving that. This year, we're celebrating Ears Sweet 16. She has been serving the local arts community in Calgary and area since 2007. That year, we started out supporting visual artists only. And then in, in 2015, we shifted to support artists of all disciplines in Calgary and area. Even though EAR has grown and evolved over that time, our mission has remained the same, to provide practical and emergency resources to help sustain the livelihood and practice of artists of all disciplines in the Calgary area. To achieve this, EAR offers monthly professional and personal development talks such as this one, as well as a twice monthly online artist meetup on Facebook called Studio E. Also a wide variety of community resource information, which you can find on our website, elephantartistrelief.com. And of course, our core program of emergency financial relief for artists, the thing that started, the, got the whole ball rolling, um, is the, the emergency financial relief for artists who find themselves in a crisis situation. Applications for emergency funds are also available on our website. As a charitable organization, we rely on our funders for our operations, but EAR couldn't provide the main offerings it, it exists to provide without the support we receive through our volunteers, uh, our members uh, beginning and renewing their memberships and the proceeds from our fundraising events. We wouldn't be able to do many of those at all um, without, without you. Um, our emergency relief fund is composed entirely of donations and the money from fundraising initiatives. You can help us by raising awareness about EAR, and if you can, consider donating online to help artists in crisis. Our heartfelt thanks goes out to all of those who have already gifted EAR in the past. This year, we are encouraging our supporters to contribute a monthly donation of $16 to mark this anniversary. Don't forget, every dollar donated to the emergency fund is allocated to providing relief for artists in times of need. As I mentioned earlier, another important way you can support EAR is by becoming a member. 
We offer many perks for our members, including our e-newsletter, discounts at a growing list of Calgary-based businesses, voting privileges at our AGM, eligibility to join the EAR board, and access to group health insurance. We have several levels of membership for individuals and organizations found on our website, elephantartistrelief.com. And we even offer a 10 year, a $10, sorry, yearly membership for students and those whose budgets are a little precarious. While donation cash goes to help artists in need, the money from EAR memberships goes to support our administration and our programming, including events like the one you're attending right now. So just a few last bits of housekeeping. Throughout the presentation, we ask that you keep your mics on mute and your video off. So there's minimal background inf interference. And please feel free to use the chat box to write your questions as they come up. And we will start a record of those for the Q&A portion of the evening. Um, tonight's presentation will last approximately 60 to 75 minutes, and then we will take a 10 minute break. At that time, we'll provide a link to a feedback form for you to fill out during the break. Please take time to fill out this form. Your feedback is extremely important to us, and it, it helps to inform how we move forward. Uh, then we'll move on to the Q&A segment, which will take us up to 9 p.m. So before I start, there's something else that we discussed before the before we started, we should mention. Um, Carrie and Chris are both in Edmonton and Carrie mentioned that there's this huge storm heading into Edmonton. So there's a slim chance that one of them or maybe both of them might lose power, in which case we would, we would lose them. Uh, hopefully that would just be temporary. So we just thought we'd mention that upfront. Um, anyway, so, so now, without further ado, I will pass you along to Chris Carson. So enjoy the evening, everyone. Thank you very much. And I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Oh, so what I'm doing today is grant some grant writing tips as uh, Jill mentioned, I'm from Edmonton, Alberta, Amiskasi Wasigan. That's where I'm broadcasting from tonight. And this is just a bit about me. You can see me, my husband, my two cats. And I'm the executive director at CARFAC, CARFAC Alberta. And so I just always start with what is CARFAC? It's again an organization where artists are working for artists. The founder, Carfac was founded in 1968, did say no one is more qualified to speak on behalf of artists than artists themselves. That was Jack Chambers, the Ontario artist who kind of wrote that about what Carfac is about. Uh, what Carfac Alberta does is we serve Alberta's visual artists. It's again, we're using that phase artists working for artists. Here you see it in around uh, nine different languages. And what Carfac is known for is, has the artist been paid? That's me wearing a t-shirt uh, probably in 2013 in Ottawa when Carfac won a big case against the National Gallery of Canada uh, in the Supreme Court of Canada. What does Carfac Alberta believe in? Well, we envision a province where all visual artists thrive, where artwork is valued, rights are respected, and creativity is integral to our communities. And how we do this is through best practices, and that's through education, advocacy, and engagement. So, what are best practices? Here is this a sticker that we have. Art is an industry. We have standards, which are best practices. With the Craft Council, the Alberta Craft Council and the Alberta Media Arts Alliance, Carfac Alberta developed seven best practice industry standard documents that are available free of charge on the Carfac Alberta website. 
which is carfacalberta.com. I urge you sometimes, if you haven't already seen them, to look at them. They are about the importance of contracts, agreements, and negotiations, what you would do if your work was being to used in a fundraiser, if you are working, if you have work in a commercial gallery or if you're a public gallery, if you're organizing a juried exhibition, they have best practice documents for community-based art, for public art, and they also have a whole bunch of glossary of terms that you need to know the definitions of. So what we are gonna to do tonight is we're gonna look briefly at the idea of what is a grant? Should I apply for grant funding? Probably answering the questions of where, when, and why. We're gonna talk a bit about other opportunities like grants. We're gonna talk about how to write a grant, some tips, and a bit about, we'll sum it up with the benefits of writing a grant. So basically, what is a grant? It's money given to a person, business, government, or other organization that is designated for a specific purpose, which does not need to be repaid. So it isn't a donation, and it's usually money that's given with when it has stipulations on what it may be used for because that's what you write the grant for. But it's a, so a donation, you can do kind of what you want with, but here you have to follow certain guidelines if you get a grant. I just want to mention that uh, I sent a PDF of this talk to Elephants Artist Relief, so you don't have to make any kind of notes now. You, you will be getting a PDF of this talk later on. Okay, and a grant is a government's tool of funding ideas and projects, and it's meant to stimulate the economy and benefit the public. And what is a grant process? Well, it follows a linear life cycle that includes creating the funding opportunity, applying for a grant, making award decisions and successfully implementing the award. So it's a kind of a pre-award phase, funding opportunities and application review. Okay, so now comes to the question of, are grants really for you? So what I urge everybody to think about is, you think about your art career you presently have, and you think about what you do, you have to know what you want in your career. You have to know who you are. Then you can decide, is this grant opportunity or this opportunity out there the right fit for you? So how do we write some kind of grant? Well, a lot of this information that you see that I'm kind of reading off to you and stuff like that, a lot of it comes from the internet where I'm actually writing questions in and I get back answers. So I'm kind of using the internet wisely to kind of get information about the subject. Okay, so to write a winning grant proposal, you begin with a need statement. It's, a, it's either that or it's a problem statement. So it's a kind of like, why do I need a grant? What is this grant that I'm writing going to be for? And then you support your statement with evidence such as images, digital images, photographs, news reports, you, also write artist statements, you answer questions, stuff like that. And that's the evidence that you're supporting your kind of why you want this grant. And here, this article also mentions that you use language and a format that is easy to read and understand, which is very important. 
So for any kind of grant, you need to have a plan. And as this kind of thing states, a goal without a plan is just a wish. Okay, so a, how do you get a plan? Well, a plan may be unwritten or it may be a fully developed document like a strategic plan or a business plan. Uh, it could be even written on a napkin. It could be part of your journal that you keep every day. Sometimes when we're applying for an exhibition, we're actually developing some kind of plan of what we're planning to do during the next couple of years, or we're applying for a residency. Uh, sometimes the plan is just our New Year's resolution, but whatever it is, we have to have some kind of plan because that helps us decide what we're trying to achieve. Okay, now a grant is like a business plan. Remember grants are for the future. You will likely not hear back for three to six months. So writing a grant, you are really planning your art career. You're kind of planning what you're going to be doing in the next year or so. But now as the success rates vary, and Carrie and Taylor will be speaking to their specific agencies what the success rates are, but it's usually any place from 20 to 50 to 60% people get grants. And so that means uh, 40 to 80% do not receive grants. So you always have to have some kind of plan B available in case you do not achieve funding the first time. And just by writing a grant, we are creating some kind of document that kind of helps us prepare for how we can manage our art career and make art and make an art business. Do you have a plan? There's plan A, plan B, plan C. Okay, now the question is of, should I apply, why? And here you have those kind of all those six questions, who, what, when, where, why, and how, which are kind of the questions that you need to start thinking about. And before you start, start with the why. What, why is this project a good investment for you? Why are you seeking funding for your project? You have to kind of know some of those questions of why should I even bother applying for a grant? And then you have to think about the other part of the why is if I'm applying for a grant and I'm going to be spending 10, 15, 20, 40 hours writing this grant, is it worth my time? So in other words, it's going to eat up a week, two weeks, or a month of my life. Is that the best use I have for this time? Uh, you have to think about, am I well prepared enough to, to write and win this grant? Do I have a complete project that actually makes sense? And then you have to think, if I am unprepared, you might be better off waiting for another opportunity. You might be better off applying for a grant next year or next spring rather than spending the next month, all of the rest of August applying for a September the 1st deadline. So really think about a grant is a very exciting opportunity, but consider the costs associated with applying. And do these benefits outweigh the costs? So you always have to think about that when, when you're applying. And now, remember, there are also other opportunities rather than these once or twice a year grant opportunities. And a lot of these opportunities are never advertised. Think about community groups, social agencies, nonprofit organizations, university and colleges, schools, business associations. 
there are many opportunities out there that are never advertised. You could consider building or designing a grant opportunity for yourself, doing it yourself and actually talking to a nonprofit organization, working something where there isn't this strict deadline coming up in September the 1st or October the 1st. And also think about today, this is the first part of Grant Writing 101. Think about the Canada Council, which will be the second part of this year grant writing program next month. And what I'm talking about now, while we're talking about the Canada Council is because the Canada Council, you have to be vetted before you apply. And the vetting before you apply for a grant can take up to a month. So if you want to be applying for a Canada Council grant, uh, you and the deadline is October the 1st, you should be putting in your apply to the portal right now to be validated so you can apply. And that can take at least 30 days. So uh, that could be something if you're thinking of applying for Canada Council in October or whatever, uh, really get your profile up there now. Okay. Now, where do you find information? Well, information comes from asking your friends, joining clubs, arts organizations, taking class, using resources at your library, using the internet. YouTube has videos to teach everything. Remember, you will mostly do it yourself, but you will do it yourself with help. There's always help from organizations like Carfac Alberta or talking to some of the granting agencies a month before a grant is due. Okay, now here's some information that you get from the web. Grant writing is no easy feat. So here are some things that they advise you to do. Determine why you require funding. Before you apply, you have to ensure that you're eligible. You have to research the funding body and sometimes look at who the previous grant recipients were. What kind of point in their career were they at? Do they give everything to emerging artists or they just give grants to senior artists? You have to be proactive about grants. You have to set realistic goals and ideas for your application. And you have to have a good budget. You have to write your proposal with life and passion. And number nine, revise, revise again, and revise with friends. You don't just write it the last minute the day before. You know, when I'm writing a grant, I have three or four people read my writing over again, and then I revise and revise again, and you submit ahead of time. Okay, so this is just other things that say almost the same thing. Uh, you know, so this is when you're looking at the internet, you put in some questions, but I mean, here they have a few different things on this one. Put yourself in the shoes of a financier. So you have to think about why would the grantor give me money? You know, am I actually doing the right things? Mentioning your strengths, not your weaknesses. But sometimes some people will say honesty is so very important for certain funders and you probably want to be very honest. So you want to mention both your strengths and your weaknesses. Okay. Now the last three months I've been I probably wrote two or three grants and all of them have kind of like these word count questions and stuff like that. So I was kind of looking at some of the ideas on how we can write to, you know, 200 words and stuff like that. So the next three slides are looking at that and they say, delete words like that, erase that, remove adverbs and adjectives. We don't need to say, very nice, but we can just say nice. Use shorter words, trim wordy phrases, choose an active voice, revise needless transitions, eliminate conjunctions. And 
the same thing is in, if you look at this slide, look for redundancies in your arguments, eliminate unnecessary or auxiliary information, get to the point, delete the and that, eliminate unnecessary prepositional phrases, use an active voice, um, pay attention to the details, write a direct answer to the question, restate the question in a way that includes the answer. So that sounds very basic and stuff like that, but that's how you can kind of start to actually be sure you're answering the right question. Explain your reasons in sequence. Give examples to expound your reasoning. Concludes, conclude with the position in your answer. Where do we get knowledge from? Again, these are the places. Everything from ear to Carfax, Alberta, Calgary Arts Development, the Alberta Foundation for the Arts. Now we'll just get into briefly to uh, some tips on writing a grant. And the two tips that I'm going to be giving you are clarity and honesty. Now the word clarity, you can learn from others. Honesty, you learn on your own. Okay, so clarity. Does your proposal make sense? Do the figures, the numbers, and the budget add up? Do you answer all the question the reader has, like who, what, when, where, why, and how? This is just uh, a page when we talk about uh, how you do that kind of opening sentence or whatever. This is the uh, first paragraph by suggested by Stephen Williams from the Edmonton Arts Council. And here it's my name is, I'm a, this kind of artist. I have been practicing for this period of time. With this application, I am requesting this many dollars from this granting agency. My intent is to do this particular thing over the course of this particular time. The bulk of the grant will go to these types of expenses with the ultimate goal of moving forward my career in this direction. So in this one, two or three sentences, they answered the questions, who, what, when, where, how, and why. So as a reader to the grant, you kind of know what they're gonna be discussing as you read the other questions. Now, too many grant applications fail because they don't include who is applying, what you want to do, what do you, when are you going to do it? Where did you come from? How are you going to do it? Why do you want to do it? And without this information, your grant reader is left confused. Have a couple of people read your proposal. That really can make your clear your your argument, clarify your argument, and have it make sense to a lot of people. If they can understand what you're doing and absolutely make sure that your proposal addresses what is asked for in the guidelines for the grant. Okay, clarity. So you make sure you, you, your work is clarity, make sure it's concise and make sure it's compelling. So the three C's are very important when you're writing clarity, concise, and compelling. And for the guidelines, read them at least twice or three times, make sure you understand them. And if you don't understand them, reach out to the granting agency or an organization or an individual that can help you. A grant is like a business plan. Remember, as we said, you're not going to hear back for three to six months. So while writing this, you're beginning to understand yourself and what and where you want your art career to go. Okay. Remember, you start early. So if a grant is due in the fall, you start maybe in the spring. Leave yourself time to write and rewrite. 
leave yourself time for others to read what you have written. And as you rewrite, you will begin to understand more about yourself and your art. You begin to clarify your thoughts. Honesty. And here, let's go back to that. No one is more qualified to speak on behalf of artists than the artists themselves. That's Jack Chambers, the founder of Carfax Road. And honesty is your voice, your thoughts. Honesty is all about you. As you know yourself best, a winning grant proposal is written by you. And the whole idea is you do you. Honesty involves being aware of who you are, what you want and need, and even being aware of where you are in your art career. Are you an emerging artist? Are you a mid-career artist? You know, sometimes, you know, granting or or certain kind of organizational people get asked to nominate people for grants. And the person asking to be nominated probably doesn't even know what the grant is about. So it's very important to be aware, to do research before you decide you're going to apply for something. Be aware of what a grant opportunity is for and not every opportunity is suited for everyone. You have to ask yourself, who is the intended audience for a grant? And then you ask yourself honestly, are you a good fit before you go to the trouble of applying? Always remember to answer who, what, where, when, why, and how. The benefits of writing a grant? Well, you have that time to do a project. Time is very important. You also have the ability, when you're writing a grant, you have the ability to make something happen, something that you want to see succeed. And you also get, you also have that kind of idea of money. I mean, but remember here, the money is for completing a job. So it's kind of like wages. It's not really a gift. So it's, it's really just for doing work. Okay, so you always have to have a plan. And if you fail to plan, then you are planning to fail. Always answer who, what, when, where, why, and how. Always do your homework. You have to do research in order to decide if this is the right fit for you and so that you are not wasting your time. And that's about what I'd like to share with you today. I'd like to thank you very much. And I'm going to probably stop sharing my screen and... Uh, let Margo uh, introduce the next speaker. You bet. Thank you so much, Chris. Awesome as always. And uh, now I would like to uh, introduce Carrie McQueen from Alberta Foundation for the Arts. Thank you, Jill. And Margo, sorry. Okay. Is my screen showing okay? Here we go. Yeah, you can see my screen, correct? Yes. Thank you, Kayla. Um, hi, thank you for that, Chris. That was fantastic. Um, I'm Carrie McQueen, and I'm coming to you from Edmonton, um, Um, Treaty 6 and Métis Region 4. Um, thank you again, Elephant Artists Relief, um, for hosting us for this wonderful panel. Um, we look forward to it every, I guess, twice annually. Um, so I'm here to present a little bit about the AFA's individual project grants. Our primary focus will be visual arts and new media tonight. 
Um, what is the AFA? Um, the Alberta Foundation for the Arts is an agency of the government of Alberta, and we also are overseen by a board of directors, not unlike a nonprofit organization like ERE. The AFA is responsible to the government of Alberta through the, the Ministry of Arts, Culture, and Status of Women. And staff like me, I am employed by the Arts Branch, and we provide the consultative and admin services to carry out AFA's programs like our grants. Um, AFA has different kinds of grants and programs. We do have grants for organizations, um, both operating grants, and we will have a project grant we'll be announcing in October of this year. Our focus tonight, of course, is grants for individuals. Um, Non-registered ensembles or collectives can also apply to our individual artist grants. That just means you can't be registered as a nonprofit. Um, if you're working as a collective or within a collaboration. Project grants, as Chris mentioned, they are intended to support a specific activity. So for the Alberta Foundation for the Arts, we're looking for activities that have specific start and end dates. We do have other programs as well. You may or may not know that the Alberta Foundation for the Arts also hosts Alberta Art Collection. We have the Arts Acquisition by Purchase um, application program called AAA, and you can apply once a year if you wish um, to submit your art um, for purchase to be added to the AFA's art collection. Um, that program is not a grant program, it's a purchase program. So we actually do buy your art from you, and um, that is done by expert panel or external jury, the same way that our grants for individual artists are. We also host several uh, four scholarships. Um, the one that is most relevant tonight for you as visual artists is the Queen's Platinum Jubilee for uh, visual artists. And that is for um, students under 25. And it's a $7,000 award. It's not a grant, which means you get the money and you don't have a final report. So that's the best part about awards as opposed to a grant. The AFA does support individual artists in all disciplines who are also Alberta residents. And you need to have your residency in Alberta for one year prior to the deadline that you're applying to. Um, your project request can be up to a maximum of $15,000. You don't have to have a giant project. Some artists ask for a couple of thousand. So there's no set limit or rule about how small or large the project is. Um, I've mentioned also that they're the completion of, of specific projects and they cannot be retroactive. So AFA does not support a project that starts before you have submitted your application um, or a project that's already been completed entirely. As you can see on the screen, we also have four primary subcategories and it's okay if your project straddles those. That's pretty common, especially in visual arts. Um, what the AFA does not support are non-Alberta residents and it's really important to make a note that this includes any principal artists in your projects um, that happen to not be Alberta-based residents of, um, in the project. Sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Um, principal artists for the AFA are artists uh, that have creative control of the project with you, say a partner where you're collaborating. If they're, say, based on Saskatchewan, that would make your project ineligible. Um, if you're contracting a technician or somebody that works in a support role for you or you have creative control, that would be eligible because they're not a principal artist they're a contractor that you're bringing on. So some of those nuances, if you're ever unsure, you can reach out, be like, hey, Carrie, um, is this person a principal if you're not sure? Um, other things we don't support are recreational training projects, i.e. going to the city of Calgary Parks and Rec um, for some of their uh, family activities. Component or partial activities are also ineligible. Um, the most common example we have here showing on the screen is say, for example, you are doing your Bachelor of Fine Art and you only want to apply for three courses of an academic year. Um, we would be like, no, you're actually applying for tuition or at the very minimum, one year of your academic program, or you can do two at once, but you can't do a small component like just your thesis exhibit or just a course. Um, applied arts are not eligible as well because these are considered part of cultural industries by the Alberta government. And there's a separate section um, of funding available for those. So you can see some examples on screen like gaming, architecture, 
fashion design, uh, um, basically commercial arts in, in general. There are some gray areas where artists kind of straddle those commercial worlds and the non-commercial worlds. And if your project is kind of in those gray areas, always reach out to check eligibility because I'm there as staff to help you kind of go through those nuances to see if there any aspect of what you do that could potentially be a good fit for the AFA. Um, ongoing activities like regular ongoing activity that's not actually a project you may not be eligible. So make really sure it's got a distinct start and end date. Um, as Chris mentioned in some of his talk, the reason that you're reaching out to AFA, that you're writing that grant to any funder, um, the question I ask most when people call me, what is it that you want or need? The most common response I get is I need money. Um, that's actually a bit of a red herring. A grant is a tool to help you access resources to get to the goals that you're trying to achieve. So money is a tool, it's not an end result. Um, it's a, I don't mean to dismiss the grant or money, it's a really, really, really important tool, but it's not your practice. It's a means to get to where you wanna go. So the real question to ask yourself is, okay, I need a grant, yes, I need money, that's given because it can be really expensive um, to be an artist, to keep your artistic practice going in the direction you want. What are the goals you need to reach? Are they like some of the examples on screen? Do you need to create a new body of work? Is it artistic production? Is it skill development? Do you need to take specialized training? Is it actually broader training? AFA does support degree programs, post-secondary, Bachelor of Fine Arts, Masters of Fine Arts, all of those kinds of things. An important note is that as the artist, it's up to you to decide what your project is, what are the parameters or the directions you need to go with that project, and what are the goals? You set those goals, not us as a funder. So that's the power that you have as the artist and the applicant is you decide what all of that is because you are the expert of your practice and needs, not the AFE. Um, as staff, we're here to help you navigate through our grant system to get that strongest grant in that you possibly can. Now for AFA grants, we have three primary components. That's the project description, the budget, and your support materials. All of these are intended to work together to tell a really cohesive story about what it is you want to do. The detailed project description is the written story, it's the narrative. It includes the five W's that Chris mentioned, the who, what, when, where, and why. These should link to the criteria of the grant. Things like your ability to do the project, that can tie directly to a timeline in your grant, for example, that shows the how and the when. Excuse me. The budget tells the numbers story of your um, particular project. And this is also tied to ability to do a project. You know, for example, what kind of money do you need to succeed? Excuse me. The most common is materials and supplies. Perhaps you need to travel for an exhibition. Perhaps you need to create a body of work. The numbers should be very pragmatic and support that activity that you're writing about in your description. Support materials for provide evidence and insight. And as you can see, things like examples of your work are mandatory for AFA start images, photographs, uh, video clips, audio clips, whatever it is that is your work. Um, support letters are great if you're an emerging artist. They're also fantastic if you're making a change in your career, say you're moving from painting to sculpture, working with clay, and if that's newer media for you, that's where support letters can be a really useful thing um, for an expert panel to see. For the detailed project description, I always like to say for any funder, no matter who it is you're looking at, assessment criteria are the windows to the expert panel or the jury. So uh, I've got the AFA's primary criteria here on the screen, the impact on you and the artistic genre in Alberta. That can be a spectrum. You may have more impact on yourself than on the genre in Alberta, and that's okay. So don't panic if you look at something like that and go, oh my God, I don't know what the impact will be. Um, sometimes you, it's hard to articulate what exactly is the impact because it hasn't happened yet. But um, that's the thing where you're looking at if then kind of statements. This is what I hope to do, then these are my hope for outcomes. These are my hope for impact on me and my skills or my career development. Your project will also be considered under kind of the veil of its uh, merit, artistic, educational, or promotional. If it's a marketing project, the robustness of your marketing plan will speak to, oh, how, is, how much merit does this project have? 
if you submit a grant, I'm going to put stuff on Facebook, blah, period. Obviously, that may not have a lot of merit because you haven't provided enough information for the panel to determine how far is that going to reach and help to advance your career and get your name out and so forth. Educational merit can be tied to things like working with a mentor, working with an elder out in the community. Um, it could be tied to getting a degree program or an undergraduate degree. So that from um, educational merit is tied to that opportunity that you're pursuing. Artistic merit is tied to things like if you're exhibiting exhibiting in a show, um, you can also apply for a curatorial project. Um, also, of course, creation of a body of work. Um, ability to complete the project is really important. And that's a lot of what Chris spoke to kind of ties right into this. When you tell the panel about here's who I am, here's what I want to do, here's how I'm going to get there, and here's what my hope for outcomes are, that's kind of all tied to your ability to complete it. And the budget supports that by saying, um, if I'm traveling to this thing to do this research in the budget supporting that you have enough money put aside for travel. If you have children, do you have childcare in the budget so that you have time to do the project? Things like that. Um, personal objectives and outcomes. Again, you may not have this in concrete A, B, and C is going to happen, but do have if-then statements of hope for outcomes. It's okay if you don't know exactly what they may be, because sometimes you just can't because it's a future state kind of statement. It's, it's easier to talk about the past than it is the future. So if you struggle with that, that's okay. Do the best you can. Reach out to your friends and say, hey, does this outcome statement make sense? And um, that's a great way to get some feedback on are you clear in your writing? Um, the project grant budget is um, really important. And if you're not really experienced with budgets, you don't have to be shy about that. That's where you can reach out to myself, um, your friends, your colleagues, be like, hey, have a look at this budget. Um, for AFA, we have a form in GATE specific, specific for the budget. So you actually do it in GATE, our online granting system. All of our grants are online and I'll show you the GATE budget form so you can get a sense of what that's about. Um, in general, be really pragmatic with your budget. Ask for what you need. There's there's kind of a myth that, you know, if I ask for a little less, maybe I'll get the grant. Um, that may not be the case, especially if your project is this big and you ask for this much. Then I've seen panels go, you know, they want to do this much with this much money. I don't know if they can do the grant with that much money. It may not be enough. That can actually work against you if a panel thinks that maybe your resources are a little too tight. So don't be shy to ask for what you need, especially a new artist. And when I say new, I mean new to applying for grants. It's really common for visual artists to under ask for what they need, especially for subsistence. And I'll talk more about subsistence, which is your living expenses. Um, provide evidence that you've done your research, you've done your homework, as Chris mentioned. This is so important for a budget. Um, if you're booking flights, if you're getting art supplies, um, whatever the expense is, either pull quotes from web websites or leave a note in the budget to say, I got this quote from this website on this date. Um, that really adds confidence to the panel that you're doing the workshop. And again, that ties back to your ability to do your project because you're thinking ahead. Um, your budget must be balanced. That means if you're spending $15,000, your revenue or your AFA grant in this case should also be $15,000. Examples of expenses that are eligible with the AFA include artistic materials and supplies, shipping, crating. I won't read the whole list. I should stop, pause to mention, I'll also be sending this out as a PDF. So if you're writing furiously, I apologize, I should have said that earlier. Um, an important thing to note that is often missed, um, subsistence is eligible at AFA. It is up to $3,000 a month. And for AFA, you don't pay yourself a salary or an artist fee um, because salaries or artist fees are essentially middlemen to pay the bills. So at AFA, we're like, nope, just ask for subsistence for yourself up to 3,000 a month. That can include rent, mortgage, utilities, groceries, child care, your cell phone, things like that. Revenues, um, those are monies coming in to the project. Of course, your AFA grant is your primary revenue coming in. Um, some common questions here include, if I'm getting more than one grant, do I include both in the budget? You should, yes, especially 
This is especially relevant if your actual expenses are bigger than the AFA grant. If your budget is $30,000, it's really good to have in your revenue that you're putting requests for money out to other funders or maybe some of your savings or whatever it happens to be. Because again, that adds to the ability to do the project because then the panel goes, oh, look, there's this giant $30,000 budget, yay. And they've only got an AFA grant for 15,000, but there's not really anything clear in the revenue coming down the line. You know, Can they do the project with less than 30,000? And there's some different strategies I'll speak to when I go to our gate budget. Philosophically, there's sometimes discussion about if I only have the grant revenue in my budget, is that gonna be frowned on by the expert panel or the jury? Um, that depends on the jury or expert panel. But one thing that we do in our meetings here in the AFA is philosophically from the AFA standpoint, that is not the criteria. And if a panel starts going on, you know, I don't know if I want to support it for this reason, that's where it's my job to go. A criteria point is not do they have other revenue other than the AFA grant. So we say, okay, here you go back to your core criteria. Look at this in the budget based on that. Um, in general, if the grant is your only revenue, that's okay. That is not a make it or break it, at least at the AFA, it is just a fine thing, especially if you have a smaller budget or if you just don't have other revenue, that's fine. The whole point of the grant is to give you that support, as Chris said, to allow you to move forward on your practice. It's like, it's like, uh, it's a better version of financing for your job as an artist without having to pay that money back. If after you've got your grant, you've done your project and you've made money from sales or other sources, you do actually include that in your reporting. So I'm just going to sneak out of here for a minute to show you. This is actually what the budget form looks like in GATE. So I've um, this is a fake GATE fake application. Um, as you can see, this is a visual art budget here. Um, for example, I've shown you some struct some of the ways. This is to show you structurally how budgets might be set up. Each funder's budget forms are a little bit different. How they like you to report on numbers may be a little different, but in essence, the one thing that is the same is they're going to want to pragmatically see in common sense, what are you going to need with your money? Do you have any other revenues? What are you spending the money on? Um, you can choose to itemize it like I've done here. Paint, 12 tubes at 25, and I'm totally making up the numbers, for example. Gate totals that amount for you. Um, some people do that, and that's fine. If you have a lot of small items, um, that may break you trying to enter it, or you may run out of room in the budget. So you can also take a higher level approach. Art materials, one at 2,000. Now, if you take a high level approach with your budget like that, it's really important to have notes because the panel may go, 2,000, that seems a lot for this project. What are they getting? And most budgets for most funders, including AFA down at the bottom, you can leave some notes. And when you're unsure, comments or budget notes are a wonderful tool because they provide a context for the panel or the jury about the project. If, the, if it's not really apparent in your numbers, those notes are the best tool in the world. They're super great. So you can see here art materials, fabric, anything that you have that's eligible. Um, technology is another thing. Media artists, this, as if, if there's any media artists here, you'll be knowing all about where I'm going with this. Um, there's some things that AFA does not support with our funding, and these include capital items like purchasing computers, cameras, lights, um, and less. All the things we really want to buy, really, tri tripods, easels. We want to build a studio. You can rent a studio, but you can't do interior finishing on a studio. Um, there are some great areas or expense, ex sorry, or eligible expenses for technology. Things like external hard drives are eligible because you need these for digital artworks to exist on. Sometimes monitors, um, monitors or projectors might be eligible. There might be a gray area if you are a media artist working within an installation context. It's not necessarily possible for you to rent monitors or projectors everywhere you go when you need to have things calibrated to be exact. So in cases where there's gray areas often for the AP, we send it for the jury to make a determination. Us staff don't. Um, so further down on the budget example, here's an example of subsistence. 
or living expenses. It's up to $3,000 a month. And again, I'm making up numbers here. You can see that I've chosen to itemize it like this. Some artists choose to enter subsistence 1500 or subsistence 3000. How you do that is up to you. And again, if you do a high level subsistence 3000, you can use the notes, put rent, utilities, food, whatever. Um, artist fees, how these are handled are very different from funder to funder. For the AFA, these fees are not for you as the applicant, the subsistence is for you. Artist fees is intended for the people that you contract or pay as part of your project. So if you're working, recording music, you may have musicians that you need to pay. If you're a media artist, you may have a technician that you need to help you install some work. It could be an installation assistant. It could be an editor for video. It could be exhibition fees if you're a curator proposing a curatorial project and you want to pay your artists. And Chris, I did not take the card back rate right before I just popped this made up number in there. So I could be wrong on that. And you can give me a hard time. Um, same for screening fees if you're, you're showing video in a gallery. So those are ideas about those kinds of things. In the gate form, you can see I've intentionally created a budget that's $27,000 so that I can show you when gate gets there. There we go. Oops, it bounced to head on me. So here's the, the, the revenue side, non-AFA revenue just means any revenue that's not your grant. <laughs> and, um, if you scroll down, you can see here that I've intentionally put less revenue in there, like not enough. So Gates going, hey, you don't have enough revenue. You can only ask for 15,000. I'm asking for 20 and I've done this because I have some samples here. You may have savings in the bank. If you do, it's good to mark that as confirmed. Yeah, I've got that in the bank. And other funders may have similar types of questions they ask in a revenue side of their. Are you applying for another grant? Yeah, I am. And it's pending. I'm still waiting to hear back. Um, let's see, 5,000. I'm just going to add something. To fix an issue like this, when you apply, if your budget is higher than the grant, you either need to have real life money to make up the difference. As you can see, I've done here or you need to take that extra money off the budget on the expense side. So that's something to think about. And if you choose to add money on a revenue on your budget for any reason, make sure that it's real money you have in the real world. Because in the case of the AFA, when you apply for a grant, if you get that grant, you are obligated to do the project as proposed, no matter how much money that the expert panel gives to you. And for the AFA, they can, um, uh, choose to fund you for 50% of your request up to 100%. Um, so it's also recommended in your budget, in your grant, in your written narrative that you have an if then kind of thing um, to say, you know what, if I don't get the full amount of my grant, here's how I can accommodate or change my project to fit that. So I'm just going to pop that to my Support materials. Um, again, I mentioned these briefly before and I won't go too long into this. Um, mandatory for the AFA images, video or audio, whatever represents your artwork. If you have a marketing project, then a detailed marketing plan is really beneficial to help the panel see how and what you're doing, when it's happening and so forth, how it's gonna help promote you as an artist or get your name out, whatever the intention of that plan is. If you are taking a training opportunity or working with elders or mentors or other kind of programs or master classes, having confirmation of enrollment is really great. Alternatives, second choices are a really good idea too. That again, that's great because then if you get the money and you don't get choice one and you get choice two, we can still allow you to move forward with that grant. Um, reference letters I mentioned, those are important for emerging artists. Um, a signed contract can be provided if um, workshop performance plans. Um, if you're a commission, that reminds me, if you have been commissioned to do art, we do support that in terms of um, your expenses and costs for the project. We do not ever, ever, ever in any way use this individual project program as a way for you to get money, to sneak money into a back door to help an organization with a project that they may be bringing you in for. So sometimes there's ways in an adjunct way that we can support you in that relationship as long as it's not 
kind of indirectly going to the organization. And those are calls or emails to bring to me whenever. Now the overview is, as mentioned, we use the online grant system. We advertise, get your username if you don't already have one, at least five business days before the deadline. I highly recommend at least 10 days because we can get up to 50 requests a day the last week before deadline. We do not accept applications submitted after 11.59 p.m. on the deadline day, deadline day or incomplete applications. If you're having struggles with gate, even if you're working in the evening after business hours, send us an email because that way you're in the queue. Staff can hopefully help figure out the issue before the deadline, after the deadline is too late. So do your best to reach out before. Um, give yourself time to learn gate, especially if you're a person who doesn't really like those kind of systems. You're doing two different things when you apply. You're working with an online system and learning that. You're also working on your grant and tweaking that. So remember, you're, you've got two tasks on your plate rather than one. So give yourself as much time as you can manage. Three weeks is great. Then if life gets in the way, you've got some flexibility. Um, expert panel process. We do have expert panels for all of our individual project grants. They first assess each application, um, the artistic merit in and of itself on, on its own for you. And then when we get together to meet, that's when they look at the applications relative to each other. They are assessed strictly based on the criteria as outlined in grant guidelines. And that's why I'm there to make sure conversations and decisions are being made based on those guidelines. They are not there to provide a critique of their work or to make decisions based on personal taste. And again, if conversations start to drift, that's where I go, well, wait, you may not like um, photographs of people or whatever, but you know what, here's the guidelines. This is what you need to be making your decisions on as based on these. Um, there is a different panel formed for every single deadline. And we do our best to get as diverse representation of as we can. Uh, region, age, experience, culture, gender, ability, and so forth. Um, that's top of mind. After the jury, all recommendations are approved by the AFA's board of directors. Once that approval it happens, the next day we're out sending out notifications. Those are sent in writing, notified through the gate system to you. Um, whether you're successful or unsuccessful, you get a written notification. The notification is advertised for being about four to six months after the deadline. It's usually closer to four months after. Um, if you get a grant, we do have final reports. Um, once your activity is concluded, you must submit the final report online and GATE creates the form for you and it's 15 to 20 minutes to do. Um, we do not actually ask for your receipts, but always keep your receipts for your project and keep them well ordered because you need to refer to them to actually type in the actual expense amounts that you had. Um, also, um, grants are um, taxable income. So another reason to keep your receipts for the CRA and for your own personal records. Um, final reports are always due 60 days after the project end date. When you are sub submitting the application and you're working on that, you enter your end date and gate, it will automatically calculate that for you. Some statistics about the AFA. On average, 25 to 30% are successful for each deadline to each specific grant. So whether it's visual arts, indigenous arts, theater arts, and so on, it's a similar um, success rate for all the programs. The budgets are adjusted to ensure this, to make that as equitable as possible between the different disciplines. Um, if your grant is unsuccessful, don't automatically assume it's because you're not good enough or your project or your art is not good enough. That's like not the case. It's usually, grant is your tool, remember? So it's one step away for your project. Getting a no is incredibly disappointed. I've also had my share of them, I know what it feels like. But common problems usually include, maybe there's not clarity with the budget or there's some information missing. Um, is it viable? Maybe there's things in there that the jury wasn't really clear on. And sometimes you don't get a grant because funders don't always have budgets to support all the yeses that the expert panel wanted to support. Um, so if you get from the AFA thing called highly recommended or recommended, that means the jury said yes, but as we go down the prioritized list spending money, it means we ran out of money before we got to you. 
Um, they do put you on essentially a waiting list. And if AFA has reallocated funds that are left over at the fiscal year, you just might get an email from us saying, hey, did you was that still a viable project? Can you accept a grant? Um, that's not common, so never hang your hat on that if you get the grant. You get that kind of waiting list message. And it's competitive as well. Because the success rate is 25, 30%, always try again. Um, here's some of the, here's, this gives you a sense of how many applications we get per deadline. And we have two deadlines a year, um, March 1st and September 1st. So if you multiply that by two, that's the average intake for the year for us on the individual project programs. General summary, grants can add credibility in the eyes of others, but they are not your practice. They're a nice tool for your practice. Excuse me. Not artists choose to do grants and that is okay. There is nothing wrong with that because they take their own work and I know many artists that are like, I don't wanna put my time into that, I wanna put my time here. So it's up to you which path you choose. If you cannot articulate what you want in your project description, then you need to ask, am I actually ready to do the project or do I just need to help in getting going with this kind of writing? <laughs> Excuse me. Sit on a jury or an expert panel if you can. AFA is always looking. You can just reach out to me by email. I'm interested in sitting on a panel and I'll send you the form to fill in. You can also find it on our website as well. Um, we are looking for emerging artists, established artists, all walks of life, life sorry, all types of practices. And um, it's really important that we have new voices at the table all the time. And I did mention that grants are taxable income in Canada um, because I should mention this too. AFA does not give a T4A slip for your um, taxes at the end of the year. So always keep the notification letter that you get if you get a grant and keep your check stub because these are acceptable forms of proof of revenue for the CRA. And I have mentioned that. So this is me wrapping up now. Here's some general resources and community resources. And you can reach out to me and the AFA here. In general, always have a plan B because staff cannot guarantee a grant. And I'm happy to help um, at any time. I can offer feedback on your draft application, um, can look at your budget, answer your questions. So feel free to reach out anytime. And thank you very much. Uh oh, Margo. I'm I'm here. Oh, there she is. I was <laughs> like, here. maybe we got her when she stepped away. Sorry, I, I I wasn't hitting the button right. I don't know what happened. Anyway, um, thank you so much, Carrie. Um, and uh, I will uh, now pass you along to uh, Taylor. And we should take note. It's almost quarter after eight right now. So can we maybe be done by let me see 25 to 9 i'll do my best <laughs> okay i should be okay and uh one thing i was going to even offer is that a lot of the information that i typically talk about in these sessions um, we did an earlier one in february of this year so a lot of the content that i would have shared in the slides are in the uh, youtube video from earlier this year. So uh, I can actually pop that in the chat. Um, so I'll kind of focus more on things that I think are really relevant to our upcoming deadline, because we only have one program with one deadline coming up. So I'll try to focus on that. Um, and the February or whatever month it was that we did that this was. earlier that you can hear me blab on in more detail there. <laughs> yeah, that was February. Okay, yeah, yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Taylor. That sounds no good. Yeah, okay, I'll share my screen here. Um, I can also follow up with a slide deck as usual and like a resource page that has all the links to everything that I mentioned. So you don't have to screenshot or take notes either unless you want to. Um, okay, PowerPoint share. Play. All right, can everyone see my slides? I'll assume yes. <laughs> yep. Awesome, thank you. All right, so for those of you who may not be familiar with Calgary Arts Development, we're often called CADA for short. Um, we are the local municipal arts funder for the city of Calgary. So AFA serves the province and CADA serves the city. Um, we're mandated to steward public taxpayer dollars uh, for the public good. And that's uh, intended for the benefit of all Calgarians. 
Um, we believe in fostering a sustainable and resilient arts sector here in Mokinsis, Calgary, um, which we do primarily through making grants to individual artists, collectives, and nonprofit arts organizations. Um, and we do offer some other things as well, which I'll let you look at in the other slides, but um, this is sort of a very over high level overview. Um, we have free classified listings that you can access to look for, you know, job calls, volunteer opportunities, artist calls. Um, if you have events that you want to share online for free, you can post them in our event listings or find other events. Um, we have an artist cultural directory. So it's kind of like an opt in opt out sort of thing that if you want other artists or organizations to find you, you can give your information like your website, your uh, email, your contact info, a little description about what you do. So it's a directory there on the site. Um, we have a newsletter, there's Space Finder to help you find spaces. Um, we have a bunch of research and publications that we post internal and external. Um, events, awards, living a creative life is a whole fun area of the website where we feature um, just creatives in Calgary and things happening. And then we have a public art team, which is a little bit new in the last couple of years. So that's a kind of a separate department, but they have programs if you're uh, interested in public art grants or projects. Um, so I'll skip over that a little bit. Um, community investment is the team that I work for. So that's the, basically the grant team. So we uh, design and administer the grant programs. Uh, we're responsible for distributing 75% of our total annual budget that we get from the City of Calgary that goes directly out into the community in the form of grant investments. Um, so it's a big part of what CADA does. Uh, and the public art budget is separate from that. So uh, they have their own budget as well. Um, and beyond running sort of the processes and designing them, our team is also here um, to help direct you to resources that you might need and help you apply to a grant. Um, we're also um, here to uh, provide accommodations and support um, through those types of processes. So this is just an overview of our team right now. It's grown quite a bit since I started uh, in 2017. We went from three to now, I guess, uh, about seven people on the on the grants team. So uh, everybody kind of has different responsibilities. We run different pro programs, um, but this is just a quick list. Uh, you can find all of our contact info on the website if you need. Um, I, I don't want to gloss over this, but this is our commitment to equity. Um, so I think it's really important when we're having conversations about granting to acknowledge that these systems are usually designed in a one size fits all way, um, meaning that they're designed for the dominant culture and are really rooted in colonial Western European academic systems, which creates a lot of barriers to access for many artists within the community um, who are seeking and deserving of support. Um, one quick example of this is that most grant applications are offered online in a written format in English. Um, I know a lot of funders are working on uh, having alternative ways to apply and to, to kind of uh, access programs more equitably, including CADA, but there's a long way to go. Um, so as a public funder, we have a responsibility to provide equitable access to public funding for everyone. Um, so we're really dedicating ourselves to continuing to try to work through um, some of the institutional inequity that exists within programs and policies and practices. Um, so yeah, reach out if you uh, want to talk more about this or if you have suggestions or, uh, you know, things from your own experience as an artist on the side of applying that you want to share with us. Um, in recognition of some of the barriers that I mentioned, uh, we'll work one on one with artists and applicants um, to develop approaches that suit whatever your unique abilities or situations are at the time. Um, so some examples are translation of materials, transcription of meetings or uh, things into a sort of a written document, um, language interpretation for phone or video meetings, video or audio applications. Those are out of order, sorry. <laughs> um, so that means that if you would prefer to answer application questions verbally, you can submit an audio or a video recording of yourself responding to those um, questions as opposed to writing out your responses. And we can support you in doing that over Zoom or you can get support from friends um, or just do it on your own if you're more comfortable that way, uh, whatever you need. And we also have um, grant writing assistance, which I'll touch on next. Um, in a general sense, though, my role and the, the role of the specialists who run the programs is really to support you and answer questions. We're experts in the programs, but you're experts in your practice. So together, you know, I think we can work through understanding the different programs and making sure you put your best application forward. Um, we're happy to give feedback on a draft application if we have the capacity and time to do so, uh, whether it's before you submit. That's always nice to kind of get feedback before you actually apply. <laughs> um, but sometimes we are also able to offer feedback after a program runs 
runs. And that feedback would actually be a little bit more um, from the committee, right? So what did the, the assessment committee have to say or think about your application as opposed to just a staff perspective? So both are really valuable. Um, so the, the uh, grant writing assistance that I was mentioning, this is uh, new as, the, as of the last couple of years. Um, we understand that, you know, us as staff have limitations to the types of support that we can offer to applicants. Um, so we also wanted to formalize a process for applicants to be able to access financial assistance that might help alleviate some of the cost uh, that can come with, you know, reading guidelines, deciding if you want to apply, preparing your application, or if you get a grant, you know, um, working through your investment agreement, interpreting that, signing it, sending it back, uh, managing payment, and then, you know, doing a final report. So basically this type of assistance is available at any part of the application or grant process. Um, and it's really intended for artists who self-identify as being deaf or hard of hearing, having a disability or living with mental illness, or artists who may face language, geographic, or cultural barriers. Um, so those are kind of the general eligibility pieces. But basically, if you're experiencing any sort of barrier to access, um, you're eligible. And it's a very straightforward process. You basically email me and say, hey, I'm interested in application assistance. And um, we kind of look to the artist to uh, decide who they want to work with. But CADA will basically pay whoever you choose to support you in the application process. Um, we'll pay them directly. So we have maximum amounts that we're able to offer depending on the service. Um, it could be a trusted friend or family member or peer in the community, or it could be a professional service provider. So if you actually want to hire like a, a professional translator or something like that to support you. Um, we can sometimes make recommendations, but typically we want to put trust in the artist to work with who they, who they feel most comfortable with or have a relationship with. Um, yeah, so if you have more questions about that, just reach out. Don't be shy. Um, so I'll skim over this. Uh, I think Chris kind of talked about what is a grant. Uh, it's an investment in you as an artist. Uh, it doesn't have to be repaid, but usually it comes with um, uh, some sort of requirement at the end of it. So usually a final report where you're kind of reporting back, what did you do with the money? How did it impact you? You know, what were the outcomes? Um, and that's really beneficial for us to know the impact of our investments. Um, and also a little bit of like a you know, something we have to do <laughs> to, to show that someone didn't get a grant and run off to, uh, you know, an island vacation or something like this. <laughs> um, but yes, it's a it's a grant and um, uh, we have different grants for organizations, individuals and artist collectives. So that leads to the next slide here. Um, there's different types of grants. Um, for different types of sort of entities, I guess. Uh, some programs will offer year over year funding. So that's typically like an operating grant for an organization. They might be on like two or three year sort of ongoing cycles. Um, and other grants, more typical ones are one-time grants that support a specific project or activity or an outcome. So like a project grant. Um, some funders might have programs that are really specific to a type of activity. So like a research grant, or a touring travel grant, something uh, specifically for professional development and learning. Uh, some grants might be uh, specifically designed for a community or a, or a discipline. So it could be a grant that is only available to Indigenous artists or uh, music artists, so it could be discipline specific, um, or it could be context specific, like we have had emergency relief funding that we've pulled together for, you know, a pandemic or a flood, <laughs> um, or a grant might have a specific goal in mind that, you know, the, the body or the funder is trying to achieve. So maybe projects that relate to climate change or truth and reconciliation or youth initiatives. So uh, like has been mentioned, really make sure you know what the grant is, what the goals are, if you're eligible, um, you know, how much you can apply for all of those details, read the guidelines so that you really know if you are uh, a good fit for that program. Um, our programs at CADA can vary year to year based on things like our annual budget from the city, program evaluation, feedback from the community, um, and just the current context of the sector and the needs that we're seeing. Um, but typically we do have some repetitive grants. So we've had project grants for many years and we have a micro grant that will probably continue into the next year as well. Um, but regardless, you know, always tune in to CADA's website, follow our newsletter. We announce all of our programs for the full year at the start of the year. So we run on a, a calendar, January to December. So next year, we'll announce all of our programs for 2024 in January or February. So you can kind of plan for your year and know what's coming and when the deadlines are. 
Um, this is general eligibility for individual and collective programs. Uh, I won't go into the details, but we all of this is described and explained in our FAQ. We have definitions like a glossary that you can look at, and it's also usually described right in the program guidelines. Um, but, you know, we define what is an individual artist or a professional artist, what is a collective. Um, we support artists at any stage of practice, so whether you are a, uh, emerging, mid-career, established. Um, we support all artistic disciplines, so I won't list them all out, but it's, it's basically all of them, <laughs> including some of the ones that I know AFA or other funders are not always able to support. So we actually do accept applications from um, video game artists and designers and, and things that are maybe in more of those creative or commercial realms. Um, but, you know, reach out if you are having uh, questions about how to frame your practice and how to talk about it because sometimes they are a little bit gray area or maybe a little bit more emergent in terms of being accepted um, by public funders. So if you are hesitating or unsure, reach out and we can have a conversation before you apply. Um, our programs are specifically for folks working and living in Calgary or Mokinsis. Um, we do accept applications from folks who maybe have like an address just outside the city or in Treaty 7. Um, but you should really be able to demonstrate that you have a relationship with Calgary and the communities here and that your work is available to local Calgarians. Uh, and then, of course, you're, you know, you're in good standing, so you don't have overdue reports um, and you're allowed to have up to four open CADA grants at any one time. OK, so this is where I wanted to spend, I think, a little bit more of the time. Um, so we have an artist development micro grant. Um, the goal of this program is really to contribute to the skills and knowledge that re uh, are required to advance your career as an artist and develop your practice here uh, in Calgary. So this program is intended to support professional and artistic skill development types of activities, as well as business and career development activities. Um, it's not intended to support the, you know, the research, creation, or production of work, or, you know, putting on events or productions like uh, shows, exhibitions, etc. Um, it's really around, like, development of skills or sort of, like, the part of your practice that often doesn't get funding, <laughs> which is sort of that, um, the activities related to being able to better market, share, and sell your work. Um, so I'll give some specific examples. We've split these sort of two um, things up into streams. So the first stream is around the professional and artistic skill development. So this is really related to activities for professional development. So developing your artistic practice, skills, knowledge, relationships through things like continuing education, uh, training, learning, or development opportunities. Activities can include the earning or maintaining of credentials, um, and they can be self-directed or non-self-directed, uh, and they can take place online or in person, locally, nationally, or internationally. So your project or your activity doesn't have to take place within Calgary. You just have to be a Calgary-based artist. But we do realize that, you know, there's residencies and things that can take place somewhere else in the world um, that really have a lot of benefit to you to be able to go there, exchange your knowledge, meet other artists, work with specific mentors or institutions and bring that back and, you know, vice versa. So, um, so yeah, some examples are listed here, apprenticeships, training, courses, conferences, residencies, etc. And then the second stream is this business and career development. And so this has kind of always been eligible at CADA, but we're being a little bit more explicit about the types of activities that we are open to supporting. Um, so this stream is for activities related to the development of the business side of your art practice. So this could involve activities or opportunities related to better documenting, marketing, promoting, and sharing your work, learning or developing specific business skills or models, uh, developing or expanding your networks, markets, and revenue streams. Um, activities, again, can be self-directed or non, take place online or in person, locally, nationally, or internationally. So some examples here are like business training and development. Uh, it could be a course or a mentorship or a training that's maybe more centered around entrepreneurship, accounting, finance, legal, um, those types of aspects. It could be around developing business plans, models, or strategies. Uh, you might have uh, an application that's all about documenting your work. So whether it's, um, it should be completed work, but it could be around developing, you know, putting together your professional portfolio, hiring a professional photographer or videographer to kind of capture some things uh, that you can share. Um, it could be related to developing, uh, oh, actually, that's the next one. So marketing, branding, and promotion of your art practice or your work. So that could be website development, whether it's brand new creation or redesign of a website. 
um, publicity, media tours, interviews, attending conferences, markets, fairs, industry showcases, or networking events. So the goal should be really centered on sort of developing the, the, the business and career side of your practice. Um, so yeah, in a nutshell, this provides one-time funding for one sort of specific opportunity or activity. You might have a couple activities that kind of are connected, but we wouldn't be looking for, you know, an applicant to be doing a residency and updating their website. You really need to pick sort of one central thing. Um, you know, if you're if it's all about uh, marketing and promotion of your work, there could be a few distinct activities that are related to that. But as long as they're not disparate and really disconnected, you can include them in one grant. Um, but we don't want to see, you know, many, many things included in one sort of proposal just because because you have room in the budget. So really make sure that there's a central goal and theme. Um, yes, again, it's open to individuals and collectives, any discipline, any stage of practice. You can receive one micro grant per year. So we do have two deadlines for this program, but as soon as you get it once, you can't get it again within the calendar year. Um, and for some of our programs, we do welcome you to apply as an individual. And if you're also part of maybe a collective, you could put in two. Um, two different applications for two different projects. For this program, though, because it's a micro grant and we don't have as much money available, we're asking folks to kind of pick. If you want to apply as an individual this year, great. If you want to apply as a collective this year for something else, that's great. But you can't do you can't put in more than one application. Um, so so pick one to kind of prioritize. That could change in the future, but that's the sort of the stipulation right now. Um, you can request up to $5,000 towards uh, these activities. We have $450,000 available for the whole year. The first intake, which was in April and the spring, has already passed. So the next intake that's coming up, the deadline is September 27th. And our deadlines are always 4.30 p.m. So it's at the end of kind of the workday a little bit. And that's just so we're around to kind of help support you. We, we'd rather not work till midnight <laughs> with all the last minute challenges. So our deadlines are 4.30, not midnight. Um, they're published everywhere. So, you know, don't use that as an excuse. Um, you're unlikely to get a, an extension just because of that. Um, so do try to get it in before 4.30. Earlier, the better. Um, it does get really busy on the portal. Um, you'll find out the results of your application within eight weeks for this program. Um, so that would be, I guess, by, actually, I think I wrote it down here. Notifications will be shared kind of mid-late November for intake two. And because this program, this intake, is running so late in the year, we are offering an installment policy, which means uh, if you're successful, you can get the full grant amount um, this year in 2023, uh, kind of right after you, know, you sign your agreement and return it. So it'd be kind of November, December that you would get payment. Or if you'd like to defer it to January of 2024, we'll defer the full payment to then. And that just helps if, you know, if your activity or your residency or your opportunity is happening entirely in the next year, it's nice to get the grant money in the same year that the activity is happening for tax purposes. Not, all, not every funder can do that. We don't do it with all of our programs, but we try to offer installment options for programs that run really late in the year when we know a lot of the projects or the, the activities are taking place in the next calendar year and tax year. So, sorry, I'm skimming over. Um, yeah, activities uh, that are being, like when you apply, your activity, the thing that you're applying for, it can't be fully completed before September 27th. So if you're applying to do a residency that takes place from September 1st to the 14th, it's ineligible because it's fully retroactive. If the residency or the opportunity was happening um, and maybe it finished after the 27th of September, it would be technically okay. Um, it basically just can't be totally done before the deadline. Um, you do need to finish whatever it is that you are applying for by June 30th, 2024. So it's about, about just over six months um, from the time that you find out. This program has that sort of shorter timeline, like a six month turnaround, because it is a micro grant and it's meant for opportunities that are happening and confirmed um, sooner than later. Whereas the project grant that we run, uh, you usually have a longer timeline to, to wrap up your projects. Okay. Um, so yes, again, read the full guidelines. There's a lot more detail around this program on the website. I'll post the link in the chat after this. Um, so you can read, read all about it. Um, there's also FAQ, which have a lot of great resources. Pay particular attention to the program 
considerations like the criteria and the scoring, because that's what, you know, applications are being evaluated on and that's uh, how decisions are being made. So that's a really important part of the guidelines to pay attention to. Um, and lastly, for this program, I'm hosting a few virtual open office sessions um, over the next couple months, so all the way up to you know, maybe a week before the deadline. So I highly recommend if you do have questions uh, and you're thinking about applying, register and attend one of those open offices. They're on Zoom. I'm going to be hanging out on Zoom for two hours for each of them. You don't have to stay the whole time, but you can if you'd like. Um, but basically, you can pop on any time within that two-hour open office and ask any questions that you have. If you want to hang out and listen to what questions other artists are asking, I've had, uh, we started doing this this year, and I've had some folks who just hang out with me for the whole two hours and just wait and see what other people are asking. And quite often it leads to other questions that you might not have thought of. So yeah, you're welcome to sign up for one or more of those. I tried to space them out. The last one is kind of a week before the deadline when I'm no longer taking, you know, emails and feedback. I can't guarantee feedback that that late or that close to the deadline. So the Q&A is sort of your last chance <laughs> um, to ask any, any final questions. So I'll post that link in the chat so you can register if you're interested. Um, this is our project grant, so I'm going to skim over this because it's already over for this year, but this is one of our biggest programs. So it offers one-time funding for a project or a phase of a project, same eligibility, um, except like I said, you can apply with more than one project as an individual or as a collective, um, as long as they're distinct and separate. Um, it has a couple streams, so create and develop, which is really around creation of work or research or learning, and then program and present stream, which is around sharing your artistic work. So all of those are examples. Um, this one offers up to 15,000 usually for individuals and up to 20,000 per collectives. We had 2 million available this year. We're currently in assessment for that program. Uh, so the results of that are going out in mid-September. We did have to shift the deadline or sort of the notification timeline a little bit because we got a 67% increase in the volume of applications. So I think we received, um, I'll say just over 500. Um, we'll probably be able to fund about 28%. Um, and for context with the micro grant, we also had about a 28% success rate for the first intake earlier this year. Um, those are lower than CADA's usual success rates, but they are in line. Like, like Chris said, they can really vary depending on the program in the year between 20 and maybe 45% for us. Um, so yeah, results will be going out. This program will run again next year. The timeline might look really different though. So stay tuned uh, in January, February to kind of see when that program will run and what changes might have been made because we do we do tweak things uh, year to year. We have a couple other programs which are specifically for First Nation, Métis and Inuit artists and organizations. Um, they're the Original Peoples Program, Honoring the Children Grant and Indigenous Artist Micro Grant. Um, my colleague Morgan runs these. So if you have any questions or want more details, I'll share the link to the to each of these uh, in my resource doc. And you're welcome to reach out to Morgan. The Original People's Investment Program does have an upcoming deadline. I think it's in September or October, probably October. Um, and the other two kind of are running on an ongoing basis. Um, so they have different sort of processes around them and they are specifically for First Nation, Métis, and Inuit uh, folks. So if you know people in the community or if you are a part of those communities, definitely reach out. Um, yeah, and, and we'll, you can learn more. Generally, how are grants assessed at CADA? Um, applications to our programs are peer assessed, uh, meaning that they're evaluated by community members. So other artists, uh, peers in the community, um, individual artists, art workers with experience and knowledge from a variety of disciplines and practices. Um, our programs are all multidisciplinary. We don't have discipline specific uh, breakouts. So our, therefore our juries kind of are the same. They reflect the same. Um, we do try to make sure though, of course, that uh, if your, your application is being sent to a specific committee, there's someone on that committee who has you know, the perspective that you need. Um, again, I won't reiterate, but we, we choose a broad diversity. We're always looking for new peer committee assessors. They change for every program every year. Um, so if you are interested, it is a paid opportunity. It's, it's an honorarium. Um, and it's based on the number of meetings and the number of applications that you read, and it depends on the program. So uh, we do publish that along with the guidelines in our, in our terms of reference. So you can always take a look at what we're paying for different programs. Um, nominations are welcome on the website, but you can also just shoot me an email and say, I'm interested, or I know somebody who would be great at this, and you can connect them to us in any way that feels easy. Um, 
Okay. I feel like a lot of this was covered by Chris, so I won't go into, you know, too much of this, but a good place to start when you're trying to consider, you know, uh, grant writing and, and uh, approaching this is where are you at in your own artistic practice? What are your goals right now? Um, reading the guidelines and FAQs, we'll always repeat that over and over again. There's so much info there. We try to make them really thorough. Um, that said, if you have questions, reach out. Um, but really try to consider and pay attention to what that program is all about, the timelines, the amount of money you can ask for, what you're going to be evaluated on, eligibility pieces, all of that. And, and definitely ask questions. You know, it's it's a lot of information to absorb and not every website and is very clear, even though we think it is or we try to make it clear. Um, you're also navigating many different funders and different portals and platforms and guidelines. So um, we're, we're definitely happy to add clarity wherever we can. So reach out, get to know your grant officer. Um, we don't bite. We're very friendly. And our job is literally to help support you. So uh, yeah, so utilize us. Uh, for Cato, we have an online grant portal similar, similar to AFA. Um, ours is called Smart Simple. It's new as of uh, last year, I think we started using it, maybe the year before. Time is weird in a pandemic, but um, you basically create an account. It just will ask for your very basic information, name, address, phone number, email, and you can access any of the current programs that are open through the portal. Um, there's an area to fill out your profile. You can start a profile and work on that information anytime, even if there's no grant available. Start filling out your uh, resume or your artist practice statement. Upload those things, work on those things. I can look those over as well anytime. And then once an application actually opens and you're working on it, you can start a draft. And that's where we kind of include all the you know project specific information. So the written parts, budget, which is built in, timeline, supporting materials, that's where you'll add all of that. Um, yeah, and I'm happy to demonstrate that if you are really bad at navigating portals and websites, we can go on Zoom and I'll walk you through it at any time. I might do that in the open office sessions as well. Um, yeah. Artist statements are pretty much always required for a grant, so this is a good place to start if you haven't worked on one. Um, this is really a statement that should introduce who you are as an artist um, and your overall practice and your overall goals. So it's not about the project or the activity that you're applying for, it's really an introduction to you as a whole. Um, and it shouldn't be long or difficult to understand. Sometimes you go into a gallery and you look on the wall and you're reading an artist statement, and sometimes it's not the most plain language thing. <laughs> so I think when you're applying for a grant, it might not be the same context or the same type of statement that you would include on a gallery wall or in the program notes. Um, you really want it to be a helpful, easy to read introduction um, where assessors can understand who you are, what you do, what you make, you know, what you value, what's important to you, how you do it. So uh, make it make it clear and easy to understand and welcoming. Um, yeah. Pause there. <laughs> uh, resume and CV is also something that you almost always need to include. Not for every program. I don't think OPIP asks for this, but um, it is helpful to kind of keep your resume up to date and work on work on it um, because it is often a key piece for a grant or a profile. Um, a resume or a CV is really just a clear list of experiences that are relevant to your practice. Um, it can be a helpful tool for assessors to better understand. Um, who you are, who your communities are, what your experience is, your history as an artist, uh, and especially looking at your resume as, alongside your artist statement can kind of help tell a bigger narrative and um, provide more understanding for who you are as an artist and where you're at in your career. There's all kinds of formats. Um, really, I think the key things are, you know, it's easy to read. Um, it includes only things that are relevant to your practice. You have dates and locations where necessary. Um, or descriptions that kind of help us know what the heck that experience is. You can have headings that are helpful, like education, um, exhibitions, grants awarded, media, however you want to break it out. Um, and most artists will have their resumes uh, or CVs on their website. So if you want to take a peek at other artists and get some examples and see what you like, what, what works, um, you know, you can kind of use those as a template. Um, especially because sometimes there is some discipline specific type of aspects. So that's a good way to, to see some examples. Um, yeah. How are we doing for time? Well, we're at, uh, we're at 8.45 now. Okay. Well, maybe I'll pause. Like a lot of this is in the other, um, the other session. Um, and I'll, I'll send these, these slide notes. So budgets are, you know, 
ask for what you really need. Don't work backwards trying to get the max amount. Um, make notes, use, you know, use the notes, add detail. Support material is so important. Um, it's not always mandatory, but I highly recommend using it um, to show your, your work, your capacity, the relationships that you have for the project, confirmations. Um, it's a great place to not have written stuff, but also some audio or visual components, which sort of help assessors really understand you and your project. Um, use plain language, don't make assumptions, be authentic, do research, show, don't just tell, so back up what you're saying wherever you can, and use an outside eye, like Chris said, get someone else to look over your grant, start early. Taxes are important. We do give you a T4A. <laughs> so at KDA, if you get a grant, you will get a T4A. You have to report that as income. You're, you're able to deduct all project expenses, except for unless you're you know, keeping part of the grant to pay yourself an artist fee or for subsistence. Those are taxable as income. Um, yeah, if you have questions about taxes, we have lots of resources on our FAQ. So just reach out. And my contact info, which I'll put in the chat too. End. Okay, well, uh, thank you so much, Taylor. Um, you guys, all three of you were amazing. I think you all sort of did a lot of rethinking about your presentations and they're all, they all seem to be rebooted and lots of new, new clarity. Amazing, thank you so much. Um, looks like we don't have a lot of time left for the Q&A um, or a break actually. So what I was thinking was maybe we could just, um, Vivian, if you could put the the um, the feedback form into the chat, excellent. And then, if people could just do this now, and we could we could start dealing with some of the questions. We've got about fifteen minutes, and um, we could just see how many questions we can get through. And also, please remember, if we don't get to any of your questions, um, you can reach out to to any of these these wonderful people who've who give so much of themselves every time they're here and in their jobs as well. So don't hesitate to reach out to them, but we'll see what we can, what we can do now. And please, if you do have a chance to, to uh, do the feedback form, it just takes a couple minutes. Um, what have we got for, um, for questions? So there's one here, I don't know if it was answered earlier, but one of the questions was, can subsistence expenses include making monthly student loan payments? And my, my add on to that is, or any debt payments? That's a good question. They're, they're all shaking their heads. <laughs> Carrie, yeah. Yeah, no, um, grants in general are not for debt reduction. So student loans, paying your taxes. Anything that is debt or tax is not eligible for AFA. Follow up to that, Gary, is would like, so subsistence, does that include, you know, my general bills for the month that I'm doing yeah, the project? That, okay. Yeah, that subsistence could include things like mortgage or rent, childcare, utilities, your cell phone, your groceries, um, in-city travel, say to your studio and back or your activity and back, stuff like that. Great. And then there was a question about whether or not they've seen an, if, if you guys have seen an impact on the number and or quality of applications since the advent of chat GPT or AI. I love that question though, um, because when we got our increase in volume this year, I immediately was like, it's AI. <laughs> like everyone, <laughs> everyone's using ChatGPT. I just know it. And I mean, because of the volume, like with the project grant getting over um, 500 this year. And so the most we'd gotten before was maybe 310 uh, or so. So it was quite an increase. Um, I wasn't able to read them all as thoroughly as I usually do. I just kind of very quickly skimmed for basic, you know, red flags for eligibility, but otherwise I was really sending them over to the committees right away to give them the majority of the reading time they need. And they might illuminate, you know, some issues or, or but so far nothing like weird uh, or really obvious coming through. It's, we could have a whole session about the use of AI and grant writing. And for me, I, I, I feel like it could be a really amazing accessibility tool. Like, you know, it's still your project and your ideas. It's just helping you maybe formulate 
sentences and, you know, I don't know, the, but I think it, it might increase the competition or the level and there's pros and cons for sure. There's a lot of things we could talk about, but so far I feel like it's mostly humans and, and, um, I mean, people get all kinds of different support to put together applications, whether human or robot. So, <laughs> yeah. And then there was one other, and I don't know whether or not um, this was brought up, but Carrie, can you just talk about equipment capital expenses in project budgets? Yep. Um, capital, I always joke because it's true. I know I wanted it when I did grants. Capital or expenses are often the things people want to get, but you can't. So what a capital item is or an expense is it's something that has a life beyond the project. So this includes large things from building or studio purchases to computers, cameras, tripods, lighting, um, easels. Those are capital items because you can use those for any other projects. It's not a project expense. A non-capital item that sometimes people might think is could be an external hard drive because you need this for your art to exist, say if you're working with video art or digital photography. Um, if you're a media artist or a visual artist who's working with technology and you're not sure where your technology fits on that spectrum, always reach out to me because I can help you navigate that from the AFA perspective. Um, and my, my comment earlier was sometimes monitors or projectors may be considered a project expense. Um, example, as part of your installation and that monitors or those projectors travel with everything for that. It doesn't break it up from the, the, you know what I mean? And if it's collected by an institution, the equipment would go as part of that art to that institution, say if it was collected by a media arts institution. So those are some of the things that can pull apart those gray areas. That's great. And then I would just ask anyone who's here if you have any other questions, just um, to let us know. I'll add two because it's different for CADA with capital. So I'll just make the distinction. Um, CADA is able to support capital expenses. Um, so like the purchase of equipment, but up to a certain amount. So we have a maximum or a cap on that. It's changed year over year. Um, we keep increasing it slowly. <laughs> um, and right now it's up to 2,500. So you can use up to $2,500 of our grant, whether it's project grant or micro grant um, for equipment that is relevant to the project, right? Or to the activity that you're applying with. It can't just be sort of an add-on sort of side thing. Otherwise every person would probably include, um, you know, two grand for a laptop. Um, so it does need to be sort of essential or, or not even essential, but really um, relevant to the project and the quality or like, you know, the goals that you're trying to achieve. Um, and so lots of folks are including that in their grants. Um, if you're asking for something that is over 2,500, then you just have to balance off in the budget to show how you're gonna cover the remaining, like the difference. So if it's a $3,000 piece of equipment, 2,500 from CADA, where's the other 500 coming? So maybe a personal contribution. And yeah, make a case for what, why that specific equipment, you know, backing that up in your budget support and kind of talking about that equipment in a way that um, assessors can really understand why it is that you're, it, how it will impact the project and your practice. It's good to know the distinction between the two uh, funders, how you how you look at, at capital expenses differently. That's good. So thanks for that clarification. Um, any other questions, anybody? Huh? Hmm. Okay. Uh, wow. Any more um, comments from uh, the speakers? I have questions for Carrie. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> but if other if others pop in the chat, we'll prioritize those. Um, so one question I had was: This is sort of unrelated to the grants, but the AAA, the um, that program. What happens with the purchased art? So you have this collection of art. But where does it go? What happens with it? I was just curious about that. That's a super question. I'll include the link to the AFA collections on our website in the follow-up material as well, because we actually have, I just have to look at the name of it. We do have an online um, virtual museum, it's called as well. So the AFA collects and holds in trust for all the people of Alberta. Um, 
our collection, it is the largest provincial in Canada. I think the only collection larger than ours is Canada Council for the Arts. It goes in, out into programs like TREX, the Traveling Exhibition Program, which has been around, gosh, over 20 years, maybe closer to 30, I'm unsure. Um, that's a program where libraries and communities can book a show and it travels by crate. Um, there's four different regions, but art gets everywhere. We also have, if you're in um, um, any buildings owned by the government or provincial buildings or the legislature itself, majority of the art you see on the wall, Jubilee Auditorium as well, that's AFA art. Um, we also loan it out. I think 25 to 30% of the collection is out on exhibit somewhere at any point in time. Um, and when we do purchase art, um, other than of course, giving you money as the artist, yay, we don't set the price, the artist sets the price. Um, we do have a purchase agreement that outlines what AFA can and can't do with the art, including um, reproduction rights. So we have all of that really like kind of locked down and set out. So that gives you a sense. And um, we are also speaking of expert panels looking for individuals interested sitting on that panel. It's a similar process in two stages where we have stage one, you go through all the, all the, all the, all the applications virtually like this. Stage two, um, you come into the gallery and you see the art in our preparators. We have a gallery space internally. Our preparators set up the art professionally so that it's shown it properly and to its best specs, however the artist determines that needs to be exhibited, it's set up. And then that's where final decisions are made. So that's kind of the basic process. Um, also, we have curators and um, individual interested people. You can request to come in and see the vault or to do research um, on art in the vault. You can reach out to collections. So you can also interact with our collection in that way too. So is the, that answer okay, Taylor? Yeah, oh my gosh, awesome. Okay. <laughs> I learned so much. Um, mm -hmm. The question in the chat, I actually would love to comment on. So the, um, are there grants for people with invisible disabilities? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, you can apply to any program, but when I think a good distinction I should have made when I was talking about application assistance. So if, if you know, if you have an invisible disability and you would like some support in applying to CADIS programs, when you reach out to request application assistance, you do not need to disclose any details. You can just, uh, you know, say, I experience a barrier. Uh, can I please access this? Like, there's never any reason to give details if you're not comfortable, you don't want to. Um, we would never ask you to disclose that. Um, and same within, like, when you're writing a grant, some folks will discuss or maybe disclose something like a disability, um, an invisible one or not. Um, if it feels relevant to like the context for maybe how they work. Um, so if like their timeline looks really different than maybe what you would normally expect or something, I put that in quotes. Um, sometimes folks want to provide that context to assessors because it's important to their practice or to the way that they approach their work. Um, but not everyone will, right? You may, you may choose to keep that private, of course, um, within your grant. CADA also sometimes uh, will include a voluntary sort of um, self-disclosure survey, which will ask identity questions. It's completely optional. Every question is optional. You don't have to fill it out at all. Um, but if you do choose to opt into filling out that private questionnaire, it's only staff that can see that. No, no assessors or committees can view that information. Um, but that sort of would be used some of our programs have an equity priority group tiebreaker sort of scenario. So if we're going down the funding list, funding applications until we run out of money, if two applications or more are tied and we're, we only have enough money for one more project, we might look at the equity priority group survey to see if one of the applicants is from one of those groups that has been historically underfunded or underserved. And that might be a tiebreaker decision. So it only comes into play in that instance, which can be rare, but... Um, just to kind of talk a little bit more about how Cato or why we would ever ask that if if so. But yeah, great question. Okay. Well, it looks like that's it for questions. Am I right? Okay. Um, wow. Well, I guess that worked out like almost perfectly. Look at that. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, okay. Well, thank you so much, um, the three of you for, for um, speaking like i said there seems like this whole new reboot and clarity about how you're talking about even just what a grant is and and how to approach it really really interesting so i'm myself i'm going to be glad to have access to the to the slides as well um 
um, so thank you all for for being here again, and thank all the the rest of you who who came to uh, to listen. And uh, yeah, it's been a it's been a great evening. So uh, we'll be uh, announcing the uh, the Canada Council um, event. Uh, it'll be happening sometime in the next few weeks. And um, after that, we'll see all of you for um, our next um, installment of grant writing with the AFA, Carfac Alberta, and CADA in February. So have a good night. Thanks very much, everybody. Bye, all. Thank you. Thank you.